regular meeting of January 26th and ask for a roll call. Here. Finucan? Here. Lash? Here. Snow? Here. Naylor? Here. Baker? O'Leary? Here. Ray? Here. Seven present. Thank you. Um, let me ask Officer John Lakel to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. Okay, um, moving to the approval of agenda, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? I did have a request to move the Kiwanis Proclamation, but I'm not seeing a representative present. Oh, Mark, okay. You don't have to move it up. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll leave the agenda as published unless uh, Anyone has additions or deletions? I'll ask for a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. I'll, uh, roll call. Jacobson? Yes. Finucan? Yes. Lash? Yes. Snow? Yes. Naylor? Yes. O'Leary? Yes. Ray? Yes. Seven? Aye. Thank you. Moving to the public hearing, let me herewith open the public hearing on the fire safety inspections of commercial buildings. I'll ask Chief Hicks to give an overview and then we'll turn to the public uh, comments. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Tonight I'm going to go over the proposed changes that staff is recommending that came from input uh, that was given to us uh, by the stakeholders at the January 12th Council meeting. Uh, also, you guys have a uh, red line version at each one of your, uh, at the diocese, and I believe there's some out there. Uh, this version will also be on the website tomorrow for review. Um, I'm going to go over, there's about 11 changes that staff is currently recommending. Uh, to, uh, change number one would be, after meeting with Focus, uh, they're recommending that the word commercial is inserted into the ordinance name and we have done so. Um, number two, all city-owned buildings will be subject to inspections. Uh, currently, uh, when we originally started this, we just uh, uh, proposed that the ones for human habitation be in proposed and included. Um, currently, what we're doing is now all buildings, so all means all. Uh, storage buildings and everything that the city owns will be inspected, and we have currently started that process. We have about uh, six of them done at this time. If a suggestion of focus, the definition of what constitutes a gov governmental building has been broadened to temporarily include temporary structures. A definition has been provided for the term owner to clearly delineate that either the owner or the owner's legal representative identified in the building registration and who has the authority to act on behalf of the owner was inserted. One that's new and is, was not publicized and is in uh, your guys' red line version up there uh, is subsection or section C, subsection one. This is a benefit to the property owner. Uh, we did not believe it was fair after reading through the ordinance uh, that if you had any violations, you would be subject to reinspect every year. So what we did is, uh, if you do pass your inspection at the time of uh, the reinspection, you're not going to reinspect it until the end of the third year period. The sixth one, at the request of focus, the term inspection has been added to the definition of pre-plan walkthrough. Number seven, the definition of third-party inspections has been clarified to indicate that such inspections are not completed by the city or its agents, but rather by third parties. Number eight, both the fire safety inspection report and the pre-plan walkthrough report 
our documents and they would, they would be included in the ordinance and approved by council if you decide you want to change them. So there will be no changes unless you guys approve those uh, changes firsthand. The ninth one is uh, focus at slot uh, clarification of the inspection process to include common areas of buildings and of residential uses. And we did a minor rev reversion of that language and that has been provided to clarify the use. The tenth one, on the issue of building permit fee reductions, that section has been amended to reflect that the incentive is only available to remediate violations discovered in the first round of inspections. And number 11, on the issue of grandfathering, language was added to the ordinance that now requires the city to conduct a conference with the owner to identify the applicable codes based upon the age of the structure, the identification of the standard that is attained, and the identification of the standard which adequately protects the public safety. So it's a clear delineation on when the grandfathering clause would take effect. Those are the changes that we proposed. Uh, there is no other changes in the scope. Uh, it will still be done by uh, on-duty firefighters with no additional staffing costs. Um, I'll answer any questions you have. Uh, otherwise, we can turn it over to you for your... Uh, okay. Yeah. At this point, I'd like to turn to the uh, public comments portion of the public hearing. We will be coming back to this um, in ordinance consideration under uh, item G2. Um, Linda Walt. <coughs> Good evening, Linda Wall, 400 Leonard Avenue in DeKalb, Illinois. Um, I'm here um, thanks to the council, um, the mayor, and members of the city administration for giving us an opportunity to talk about the ordinance. I've been here before, so um, I'm going to, I, I think that the staff is, is making an effort to deal with the stakeholders on this, and so I talk less and less because <laughs> more and more things seem to be getting worked out, um, and, and we appreciate that. Um, I'm still concerned about the fact that there's no Exhibit A um, attached to the ordinance, and I understand that's actually the report itself, the fire inspection report. And if I'm reading this correctly, you say in the ordinance that it's not going to be codified. I'm thinking that's why we're not getting a copy of Exhibit A. I continue to have issues with that issue because my um, sort of approach to this from the very beginning is people that have buildings need to know exactly what they have to do to pass the inspection. And so they need the notice that comes from having a copy of the report or the standard or whatever you're using to decide who is in compliance and who's not in compliance. So I remain committed to the idea that that needs to be done. The other thing is grandfathering. Members of the council know, and a few of the staff members know, I did write a letter, which you all should have received. I wrote a, what I consider to be a fairly good grandfathering provision. Um, the city has not adopted that, and I'm not here to say that they have to, but I think that there are merits to the way that I wrote it, in that it's more specific language, it's not in the past tense, it actually says what the city does instead of using it shall happen or it's not an it, it's a city. And the city has power over us as property owners. And so if this is going to work at all, we have to get our, our, a handle on the grandfathering part of it because if you would take a drive from Peace Road all the way through town um, on Lincoln Highway, let's just say you go to Annie Glidden Road, and you look at how many buildings you're going to inspect just from that ride. Because you're not talking about one building that faces Lincoln Highway. You may be talking about another building behind it, and another building behind it, and another building behind it. And these are people who are now going to be subject to the inspection. And everyone that knows anything knows that our stock of commercial buildings and industrial buildings in DeKalb is not the newest stock that you can find. We are lucky to have some newer buildings, but the rest of us are dealing with old buildings. So I just want to know, when you come in, what code's going to apply to me? 
how we're going to figure that out. You have a building that may have had three additions to the building. How is all of that going to be worked out? More specific language about affirming the fact that we have to deal with the issue um, that is going to be staring you in the face. Truly, I think within 24 hours of the day you start the inspections, you're going to have to be doing this. And so it's going to be work not only for the city, but also for the, for the owners of the buildings. Um, the only other thing I wanted um, to uh, talk about is that maybe it's a little premature um, to have the first reading and to be making decisions yet. I think that there are a few more tweaks that could happen to the ordinance. Um, but as I said, I do appreciate the efforts of the staff. I think that they've been cooperative and in talking with the stakeholders. Um, and I think that we've made some progress, but maybe just not there yet. So thank you thank very you, much. Linda. William Heinesch. Good evening, Council. Uh, my name is Will Heinisch, local businessman, uh, focus representative, and a property owner. Uh, at 1 p.m. today, Mike Coglin, who you're familiar with, has spoke before, but past state's attorney and a local lawyer, and I were able to sit down with Eric Hicks, the fire chief, Ellen DeVita, the community development coordinator, and Dean Frieders, the city attorney, to discuss the actual words of the ordinance and how it affects the concept of the ordinance. It actually is something I've requested several times where you can have an engaging conversation back and forth instead of just coming up here and telling three minutes and spewing out words that to my famous TV land um, people that like me. Um, this engaging back and forth, which actual city staff, I think we learned a lot. And I think all three of them, when you actually engage back and forth and share that communication, it's what because you can redline an ordinance and the city attorney can look at it, he can look at our red line, we can look at his red line, but until you actually get the backup material and understand the real red line, there's a lot of misconceptions and mischaracterizations that can happen. So I'd like to thank the city manager though for setting up that meeting we had today. Um, we were only able to get through half of the ordinance. Uh, we met from roughly one to two o'clock and we were able to make, I felt, a lot of progress in suggesting changes to the city ordinance in an attempt to clarify wording so both the city and the citizens are protected. Changes and clarifications in words such as complete inspections and all areas of the building to inspected, words such as any, uh, which are very specific, and yet in the beginning of the ordinance, it talks about the ordinance being loose least intrusive, these words make it most intrusive. So what we're trying to do is actually look at the actual words and how it affects the concept. And I think they were surprised too, as we were in that engaging conversation, that what the words mean and how it affects the ordinance. The current ordinance states, as presented, that the 24-hour access key holder will be the legal representative of the owner. This, in most cases, is really two different people. You should not designate the person that has 24-hour emergency access because that could be a simple maintenance person. They might not be the legal person or representative as that might be the owner himself or the attorney. What we're really talking about is three different entities. The owner, a person to permit access to the building for inspections, which could be a tenant or an owner, and then third, we're talking about emergency key holder access. So if the police chief has a burglar alarm going off in the middle of the night, if the fire chief has uh, fire issues or a broken waterhead, this 24-hour access person is available to city staff for emergency responses 24 hours. And that should not be binding as the legal representative. A legal representative, actually, we feel, should not be used in the ordinance at all as because that could change from time to time uh, or possibly the building owner or his lawyer. Uh, there's no need to really expand registration information either as the county treasurer already has taxpayer name for each property, secretary of state has name of registered agent. Um, and so when you start talking and digging into these and have this discussion back and forth, you can learn a lot from one another. Um, but 
we would be opposed to having to designate a legal representative at all, but really identify those people that you really need. Again, more work needs to be done and clarification in the area of registration. Uh, we have said annual registration is not needed every year. It's just simply busy work for city, but simply a verification process. And I think the city staff that we met with agreed that really only changes to the registration information need to be updated. We don't need to re-annually register every year, but just a simple verification where the fire chief sends out an email to the person or mails it out, yes, this is correct and sends it back. You don't need to re-register, but a simple verification process. Uh, twice in the ordinance, it states the city could revoke a tenant or owner's business license for an owner declining a walkthrough inspection in another part of the building that maybe the owner has a safe for valuables or an area for privacy. This really is a, allows the city unfair leverage against an owner or tenants to revoke a license. Taking away one's right to do a business when one is declining a right when no violation even exists is just totally unfair and not practical. Um, if the city decides someday, and I always look 10, 20, 30, 40 years out, if the city required all businesses to be licensed someday, this could be huge that you, the city could revoke somebody's license because an owner in a building and maybe another tenant in another portion of the building could leverage that. So there should be nothing about declining or revoking a license for simply an owner to decline inspection of part of a business or building. Uh, I have only briefly touched on the changes. Uh, it was a packed hour, I would say the least, very intense uh, in our discussions. And we continue to make this ordinance better. Um, and in this meeting, I think Ellen and the chief agreed with suggestions of our words and added some of their own as Dean was feverishly taking notes. I still think we have many more details to work out and we're making progress in a good way. Um, like I say, we only got halfway through the orange today, and we offered to meet with city staff as soon as possible again so we can keep moving forward progress. Uh, when people can sit in a room together and run through real life situations and examples, their consequences, how it plays out, and we can discuss current law and the process, progress is made and continually being made. I do ask the council to weigh in tonight as we continue to make progress. Um, but I ask you to not adopt first reading tonight, but to discuss uh, the words of the ordinance, uh, if you agree that we're making progress, and your thoughts and con additional concerns that we have not heard of yet. Um, I think you will agree we are moving to move in the right direction, and please don't rush to pass this ordinance or first reading tonight. Uh, possibly have a first reading next council meeting, uh, after we get these final changes and hopefully we'll be able to meet with city staff to go through the last half of the ordinance. Okay. Thank you. Will, I'd like to ask just one clarification at the outset. You mentioned that today's meeting um, was very productive. You mentioned three previous requested meetings with city staff. Were those previously requested meetings honored? I requested in, in public hearings to have a question answer session rather than us just getting up here and giving our three minute spiel. I think it's much more productive than you can have certain city staff and certain stakeholders address dialogue back and forth. Because I can see what happens when you give a red line to one person and I don't want to nitpick, but then they mischaracterize our red line and maybe we mischaracterize their red line or their ordinance okay. when you really don't understand the thought behind it. But have you had previous conversations honored with city staff regarding the ordinance? I have... Uh, As a representative of FOCUS. Of FOCUS, yes. You've made three yes. requests. Yes, I, I think um, since this whole process started many months ago and the, was packed that... Um, uh, the requests that we've had have been honored eventually, Thank even you. though that they've been denied Thank too. But no, I, we're moving progress, and I appreciate everybody working together. Thank you. Me. Can you say how many times you have met with staff? Specifically with city staff, just one on one, just today at one o'clock was the first opportunity. But in the past, there has been other general meetings. Other than the it? public hearings where you have seen me speak, uh, there was one other. Time when it was a kind of a public hearing, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Ken Anderson. Ken Anderson, uh, P.O. Box 584, DeKalb, Illinois. I'm the Executive Officer for the DeKalb County Building and Development Association. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, staff, citizens. Um, as a retired lawmaker, I can say that the changes proposed by city staff today show that this draft is not ready for first reading tonight. Um, it should be ready next Monday which will give us a week before your, your next city council meeting so we can put uh, some modest time into the ordinance that was just released to us five hours ago because that's when the meeting ended. Um, besides the Wurlitzer and the Protano properties are being ad addressed effectively under the existing laws. So there's no good reason to rush to a first reading on an incomplete draft. So I would, uh, urge the, the council to uh, please consider that uh, you do not have the first reading tonight and uh, continue to take more information from the focus group and, and other stakeholders on this uh, very important uh, issue here at the city of DeKalb. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. James Mason. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilman, staff, and everybody here. What happened today is something that I've been looking for for years. Uh, the principal parties came together and worked wordsmithed this document to the betterment of everybody in the community. And um, I think we have a lot to look forward to in the future if the stakeholders and the citizens and the city government will adopt this type of format and Anne Marie and the city attorney uh, and the chief, both chiefs, have been absolutely wonderful that we've come this far and they've worked with us. And I, I say the same thing the other gentleman did. If we can uh, give us uh, another hour or two to go through the rest of this document, I think we'll all be on the same wavelength. Thank you. Thank you, Trim. Ted, uh, help me pronounce the last name. Hi, Hi Thank you. I'm Ted Heisey, I live at 43W212 Tall Pines Road, Elgin, Illinois. And good evening, Mayor and Council and staff. Um, I've got two buildings over kind of near the airport on Peace and Pleasant Enterprise, and they're all multi-tenant buildings. And I do have some concerns. My, I've got multi-tenants and I've got Knox boxes on the back. I don't necessarily always have access to some of my tenant spaces. Um, I have one tenant that specifically has food product in there. I don't have keys to get into the building. Um, the fire department would have access into that building with the Knox boxes that were required of me. Um, I believe you probably should have some information on who the tenant is in the buildings. They're usually the ones that are there. Um, frequently the tenant is the person that may have something in the building that I'm not actually able to or be responsible for, whether it's a forklift with an extra propane tank, um, a fuel tank that they happen to leave in on a particular day. Um, some things there are things that I cannot um, legally go in and just remove his property from the tenant space even if the fire department comes in and asks me to uh, remove the problem. Um, I've got a couple buildings in South Elgin and a one up in Huntley and the way the fire department works up there, they come in, they inspect it when the tenant's there I get a note from the fire department emailed to me and to the tenant and then basically the tenant and I kind of just check off who is responsible and then we take care of it from there and it's never been a big issue up on those situations. Um, so I think the Knox box, I don't know if you require that of other people, our buildings are more like 10 or 12 years old so I assume some of the 30 and 40 year old item buildings are not um, have those on their properties. But I, I do think that the tenant does have some responsibility and it should not be strictly the uh, landlord that is looked to for everything. Um, and I do have a question as far as with the multi-tenant, 
if you are you going to inspect all five units of mine and if one person has a single violation are you going to come back a year later or three years later and are you going to inspect everybody is the whole building looked at as one item or are you going to look at it as tenant spaces if it's totally delineated um, so that's kind of a problem I have and I always have some issues um, we, we came out here we did a small subdivision about 10 industrial lots and we built two buildings and the ordinance here talks about a dispute regarding the codes. Um, ten years ago, I had a dispute regarding codes on how the fire department was looking at the codes on building a new building. Um, I have two lots still out here. I left ten years ago. I went to Huntley and bought three acres and put up a 11-unit building up there because the fire department had enacted, um, this was Dennis Vota, and I cannot think of the fire chief at the time, and they wanted to use a Iowa method of a non-sprinkled volume of water on my property on a sprinkled building. And I spent about $10,000 in legal fees and got to a point of we had to leave the area and we went up someplace else and built a building and I still have my lots out here and I've been a good citizen and a good landlord and I just don't want this to become burdensome. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other citizens present that wish to speak in the public hearing on this topic seeing none I'll herewith close the public hearing this evening and we'll take uh, the comments under advisement moving to special items um, first I'd like to ask Chief Hicks to come forward please as uh, Chief Hicks is approaching the dais. I'd like to share um, a letter addressed to City Manager Amory Gora. Um, this is from Dennis O'Neill, Superintendent National Fire Academy, U.S. Fire Administration. Dear Ms. Gora, please accept my sincere thanks for your support of Fire Chief Eric Hicks during his participation in the U.S. Fire Administration's National Fire Academy's executive fire officer program. Chief Hicks has now successfully completed the EFOP and the required applied research. On behalf of the NFA and the enclosed EFOP, certi the enclosed EFOP certificate has been forwarded to you for formal presentation to this dedicated member of your department. You may want to present the certificate at a formal ceremony, invite your community's elected officials and members of local media to attend. The Academy appreciates your commitment to this four-year program and continued support of the NFA. I'd like to read the inscription on the certificate that's addressed to um, Eric Hicks, recognizing Eric. In recognition of successful completion of the re requisite courses of study and applied research projects, the National Fire Academy, under the authority granted by the 111th Congress of the United States of America and on recommendation of the faculty, confers the title of Executive Fire Officer upon Eric J. Hicks, with all honors, privileges, and responsibilities thereunto appertaining. Awarded this 25th day of July, 2014. It's signed by Dennis O'Neill, uh, Superintendent, National Fire Academy. Eric, with sincere congratulations and thanks on behalf of the city. Eric indicated he's not one for the spotlight, but I'd like to give you an opportunity to You're respond. Correct on that, Mayor. <laughs> I'd like to thank the mayor and council and the citizens for the support in this program. Uh, this is part of my succession program for my predecessors. Uh, I currently have two people involved in this program in various stages. Uh, you've seen some of the work from this program over the last four years. Uh, the first one being uh, the uh, fire cost recovery program. That program was done through the research of this program. Currently raises about $50,000 per year of revenue uh, to the city. Uh, my second year was had to do with code enforcement, uh, which did not come before council. My third year, which was the uh, uh, citizen notification program, which we did enact, and you now have the code red system for that, uh, the code red notification system. 
Uh, and my final project was uh, obtaining body armor for our active shooter program for our personnel. And uh, through some grant writing, we were just able to purchase 30 sets of body armor for uh, uh, the Cal Fire Department personnel. So thank you for uh, the opportunity. Thank you, Chief. Approach the dais, please. <laughs> The next item I have is a proclamation. Um, I'd like to ask Mark Petrosky from the Kiwanis Club of DeKalb and Alderman Snow will represent the Kishwaukee Kiwanis. In recognition of the 100th anniversary of the founding of Kiwanis International, whereas Kiwanis International was established on January 21st, 1915, and whereas Kiwanis International is a global organization of volunteers dedicated to improving the world one child and one community at a time, and whereas the Kiwanis Club of DeKalb was chartered on January 21st, 1921, and the Kiwanis Club of Kishwaukee DeKalb was chartered on September 30th, 1969, and whereas the two clubs sponsor service leadership programs for future leaders, and both clubs have participated in Kiwanis International Partnerships with UNICEF, and whereas the clubs donate college scholarships, fund local projects, and make contributions that enhance the community, I, John A. Ray, Mayor of the City of DeKalb, do hereby recognize the 100th anniversary of the founding of Kiwanis International and give special thanks for the service provided to the DeKalb community by the De Kiwanis Club of DeKalb and the Kiwanis Club of Kishwaukee DeKalb. Signed, John A. Ray, Mayor. Mark and Bob. Thank you both. Congratulations. And thank you both for that continuing service to our community. Um, Prairie Le State Legal Services Human Service Funding Annual Report, uh, Kathy Beckcher. And I believe, are you the <coughs> Executive Director, Kathy? Help me with your title. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, I'm the managing attorney of the Fox Valley Office of Prairie State Legal Services. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening to you all, um, and thank you for this opportunity um, for me to be able to tell you a little bit about Prairie State Legal Services. Um, as I indicated, my name is Catherine Butcher, and I'm the managing attorney of the Fox Valley Office of Prairie State Legal Services. Um, Prairie State Legal Services is a not-for-profit law firm providing low. Um, free legal services to low-income folks and seniors. Um, my office in uh, St. Charles is the office that provides those services to the DeKalb County folks, as well as Kane and, um, and Kendall County. The services that we provide run the gamut of helping people stay in their homes um, when faced with wrongful evictions, um, working with folks who have been victims of domestic violence, um, working with folks who perhaps have been wrongfully denied benefits such as um, food stamps, otherwise known as SNAP, um, medical benefits, social security benefits. Um, are the services that we provide kind of range um, from one end to the other. We provide services in the form of advice um, and education to folks um, as well as direct representation, negotiation, um, and the the support of the, the city um, helps us do that for the, for the residents of DeKalb, for which we're grateful. Um, I don't know if you want, if you had any questions, if there's specific information that anybody would like. Um, location of delivery of services. Mm -hmm. Can you help me understand where those are delivered to DeKalb citizens? I certainly can. Um, we, as I, as I said, are located in St. Charles, but we do intake um, for folks uh, here in DeKalb County. We are at the Community Outreach Building on Annie Glidden Road. We do intake for folks at Safe Passage. 
Um, we are participating in the DeKalb County Bar Association new um, legal clinic at Hope Haven. Um, <coughs> We go to folks, a lot of our folks are seniors. Transportation is always an issue for our clients wherever they are, and if necessary, we go to where they are. We are at the DeKalb County Courthouse in Sycamore frequently. We are at the DHS office in DeKalb frequently. We have a really close relationship, actually a very good work working relationship with um, DeKalb Housing Authority. So we are, um, you know, we go to where we need to go. Um, and you. in addition, we, um, work very closely with a lot of different organizations right here in DeKalb County, whether it's Safe Passage or RAMP or Senior Services, and so we're also at those locations. Very good. Other questions of Kathy? I was just gonna ask, you, how many personnel are within your office? How many people do you have that provide these services? There are eight attorneys um, that are providing these services. I have two of my attorneys live here in DeKalb County, um, which I think is, um, is, is good, and, they, and, and one in particular is very involved in the community, um, especially and the seniors. the area that you serve is DeKalb County, Kane County? And Kendall County. And Kendall County, the yep. three counties? Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Snow. I believe you also utilize law students, don't you, to, to some extent? Uh, we do. Yeah. We do. Um, we work, I, in fact, I have a um, law student in my office right now. He's a second year um, from NIU who is a volunteer in the office, right. and we hope to keep him not only through this semester, but um, through the summer and into his last year. He's got what we call a 7-Eleven license, which allows him to um, actually represent folks under the supervision of an attorney. So it's a great experience for him and it's great for us to have the extra hands. Thank you. Other questions, discussion? Thank you, Kathy, very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes. Moving to item E3, approval of mayor's appointments, the appointment and swearing in ceremony of Marsha Schweigert, city clerk. Um, you have in our um, backup material, you have Marsha's resume. Um, you have my recommended appointment in front of you. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. It's second. been moved. Second. And I heard the second. Um, I'll ask for a roll call vote. Finucan? Yes. Lash? Yes. Snow? Yes. Naylor? Yes. O'Leary? Yes. Jacobson? Yes. Ray? Yes. Seven I. Thank you. And thank you, Council, for that uh, support. I'll ask the city clerk, if you, or a deputy clerk, if you can move to the podium and do the swearing in of Marsha Swigert. Congratulations. <laughs> Swigert, having been appointed to the position of city clerk in the city of DeKalb, county of DeKalb, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Illinois, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of city clerk to the best of my ability. I do. Congratulations. <laughs> And with your uh, vote of endorsement of the appointment and the swearing in of Marsha, she will be um, seated with us this evening and joining us, well, if we move to executive session. She'll be uh, in the role. <clears throat> okay, moving to citizens' comments. I do have uh, Ben Donovan registered. Ben, if you'd come to the podium, please to address the council. Go ahead. 
Uh, my colleague, uh, Kayla Swanson, is just going to be handing out a supporting letter to what I'm about to say. So. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor, uh, Council, staff. My name is uh, Benjamin Donovan. I'm the Director of Governmental Affairs for the Northern Illinois University Student Association of Student Government on uh, NIU's campus. Uh, we are the uh, official uh, we're the official representative body for all students on Northern's campus. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you uh, tonight regarding the recent discussions uh, surrounding the bar entry agent to Kalb. Uh, given the relatively intense coverage that this issue has received, uh, uh, we at the SA felt it prudent to come before you tonight to explain our rationales and make the uh, NIU student voice heard. Uh, first, I'd like to begin by uh, acknowledging a recent editorial on the issue published in the Daily Chronicle. Uh, the editorial, in our opinion, uh, struck a tone that seemed both dismissive of and condescending toward uh, this recent student advocacy. Uh, in particular, referring to an idea which has yet to be fully fleshed out or examined by relevant stakeholders as, quote, a non-starter, unquote, uh, seems especially premature, at least as far as we're concerned. Uh, second, we wish nothing more than for an honest, open conversation with the city regarding this issue. Uh, thus far, the issue has been clouded by judgments, misunderstandings, uh, and assumptions not based on data, but rather emotions and opinions. What we would like from the city is a forum <coughs> excuse me, to conduct and discuss this as a possible policy. Uh, our contemporary universities and cities have such policies in place, and we want to hear from both the students and stakeholders in these places. We also want to have a full perspective on the issue instead of the voices of a select few. Uh, too often, uh, NIU students are written off due to a lack of cohesion or collective voice. And we assure you that on this issue of the bar entry age, that this is not the case. Uh, just last night, the Student Association Senate, a representative, another, uh, the legislative branch of the SA, uh, completed the first reading of a resolution in support of furthering this discussion and investigation, not recommending, the, uh, not in support of a policy change, just in furthering the investigation. Uh, likewise, we, uh, as Ka Kayla passed it out, uh, we have brought with us a statement from Student Association President Joseph Rochello, uh, who expresses similar sentiments. Uh, the Daily Chronicle expressed that we at the SA should, quote, work within the system to make DeKalb a more student-focused university town, unquote. Uh, we, we would submit to you that this is exactly why we're here. We feel strongly that students, small business owners, and they're in the city would benefit from the increased engagement with the city and the increased engagement of students uh, participating uh, in uh, bars. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Benjamin. OK, moving on to our consent agenda. You have before you the consent agenda. Are there any um, items council members wish to remove? Uh, not to remove, just a point of clarification. Uh, and two of the things that refers to the Kishwaukee bike path or Kishwaukee uh, bike path, I want to just make clear that that's a Kishwaukee Kiwanis bike path, please, <laughs> so that um, it's very clear which we're talking about. Okay, thank you. Alderman Naylor. Yes, I would like to remove uh, item number five, the uh, agreement with Sexual Consulting Group. Okay, so removing F5, we'll deal with that under separate action. Any other items to be removed? Hearing none, I'll ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda as revised. So moved. Second. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Moved and seconded. Um, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Carried. Um, is there a motion to approve the, to do an omnibus vote approving the items on consent? So moved. But it's been moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Roll call. Snow? Yes. Naylor? Yes. O'Leary? Yes. Jacobson? Yes. Finucane? Yes. <coughs> Lash? Yes. Ray? Yes. 7i? Thank you. Item uh, resolution 2015-7, authorizing an agreement with 6L Consulting Group Incorporated for the purpose of performing an airport governance study in the amount of $20,000. 
Is there a motion? So moved. Moved. Is there a second? Second. Second, second discussion. My only, yeah, my only point for uh, uh, removing this is to clarify in the uh, consultant's uh, agreement the provision uh, to provide a uh, personal uh, presentation before the council uh, was uh, included was not included in the seventeen thousand five hundred dollars I believe but would be an extra and I just wanted to clarify that I think on an item that is as important as this uh, study uh, could be that we should include definitely a presentation in front of the City Council and hopefully that would be a presentation shared with the Airport Advisory Board and if that costs some additional money which I think they quoted fifteen hundred dollars that I would like to see that that would be included in their proposal and I would put that in a form of an amendment if I can for clarification Director Moore uh, if I may, uh, that is included. It wasn't specifically outlined. I did talk to Sixel. They said absolutely there is a presentation to council that will occur. I had asked for the t up going up to 20000 from the seventeen five, just in case for whatever reason there was additional um, travel that was required to bring them out to make any additional presentations. Uh, seventeen five is the, the contract amount, um, and that does include a presentation to the okay. City Council. All right. Okay. But uh, um, as noted in the agreement, Director Moore, should client choose to have consultant deliver report to the community in person, that presentation will be invoiced at an additional plus travel expense. Yes. And that is what started our conversation regarding that. I think that was more of a result of an experience they had with another client um, okay. because I specifically called them and said, okay, how much? You know, what exactly are we talking about here? And they assured me Excellent. that as part of the base, there was a presentation to council. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for clarifying that. Other discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask for a roll call. Naylor? Yes. O'Leary? Yes. Jacobson? Yes. Panukin? Yes. Lash? Yes. Snow? Yes. Ray? Yes. Seven I? Thank you. Moving to resolution 2015-10, authorizing an amendment to the agreement with Northern Illinois University Center for Governmental Studies, extending the multi-year strategic plan timeline. Um, City Manager Gora, please Thank you very much, this. Mayor. Uh, just going to give a quick overview before I turn the presentation over to Diana Robinson from the Center for Governmental Studies. Uh, this is an item, as you know, the council had approved and authorized in the fiscal year 16 budget. We've had some periodic uh, discussions at the council level, and I know this was a request uh, specifically by one of the council members. We have Diana Robinson here tonight to give an update on the behinds of the scenes work that's been taking place at the staff level uh, working with the center, and then some modifications and uh, changes to process uh, moving forward. Uh, at no additional cost to the city and uh, we're very excited and we are moving forward with the plan so Diana Robinson is here tonight to update the the council and if this meets with your direction we would look for a formal uh, approval changing the timeline and moving forward on this and with that I turn over to Ms. Robinson great thank you very much good evening, good evening. Uh, last year in April I had the privilege of facilitating the City Council retreat on the NIU campus uh, one of the main outcomes of that uh, activity was agreement that the city would undertake a long-term strategic planning process that would involve extensive citizen input. Um, it would provide a framework for shorter strategic goals as well as for annual operational goals. But the idea was to create a vision that would drive the, the city's decision-making for the next decade. So last summer, we were ready to begin this, this initiative when the DeKalb County Community Foundation launched a collective impact project called Advancing DeKalb County. They wanted to see if they could get all of the investors, public and private sector, to agree on an issue that they would focus on and see if we could move the needle on an issue that everyone thought was important. One of the first steps in that process was to conduct a survey and uh, of, of every resident in DeKalb County to find out what issues matter the most to them. As a result of that survey, uh, which about 2,500 uh, citizens responded to, um, we concluded that the results were not valid. 
those respondents tended to be higher income, uh, better educated, and also primarily white. And we believe that because that did not represent the profile of DeKalb County, the results as a, um, could not really be used. So we decided to wait and after conferring with Mayor Ray and Henry Gora. We thought it made sense to, um, uh, to understand the implications of that survey. And so we're, we're back to you with some suggested amendments to our scope. And as Anne-Marie said, uh, there'll be no additional cost. The additional expenses that we incur by doing a more comprehensive process will be absorbed by us. So the original scope of work um, indicated that we would hold seven strategic planning sessions, one in each ward. The idea would be to attract residents to these conversations, have four or five broad discussion questions, and elicit from the participants a real sense of, of what they loved about DeKalb, what could make it better, what would make it a city that they would want to continue to work and live in. What we've, again, concluded from the takeaways from the, uh, the Community Foundation Survey are that we need to uh, conduct additional outreach. If we want to ensure that we hear all the voices in the county, we need to reach out to groups underrepresented in that Advancing DeKalb County Survey. So um, we will uh, meet with city staff, identify how we will go about identifying those underrepresented groups, and then work with both city staff and NIU staff to hold smaller conversations, um, take our process out to the people, and see if we can um, get a much more in-depth understanding of their opinions and perspectives and, and ideas for the future of the city. The other major change is to reach out to specific stakeholder groups, make sure that we hear from business organizations, civic groups, nonprofit organizations and networks, make sure that all of the voices, again, that make up this very diverse city are heard from. So the other major change that we're requesting from you tonight is as we think about a vision for DeKalb, it will be difficult, we think, to limit it to just those services that the city provides. It's hard to think of a vision that doesn't really include education and parks and even public health facilities. So we're suggesting that the city reach out to some of these other taxing jurisdictions at the beginning of this planning process to see if they would be willing to join with us and have a more integrated, coordinated approach. We think by doing that, it'll result in a better overall vision for the city and also potentially um, result in better alignment between their investments and those of the city of DeKalb. So we do request your action on two specific aspects of our contract. Uh, the first is that you approve the proposed changes to the scope that I just mentioned. And secondly is that um, we start planning immediately so that we can launch these uh, community stakeholder meetings in April. So, okay. any questions? Questions of Diana, Alderwoman Lash. Thank you. Um, as far as, you know, locations for town halls and reaching out to the underrepresented um, populations, um, I really like the idea of doing one in each ward. When you're thinking within the ward, um, you know, maybe kind of reaching outside of where the normal, you know, the normal meeting locations are. I know, you know, third, just thinking of my ward, the third ward, you know, the most common place to hold a meeting like this is Hopkins Park. But if you think of where the underrepresented um, population is, you know, maybe the Women's Center Conexion would be a better um, place to make sure that they can get to the meetings and so just thinking along those lines as far as town halls and, and, and community meetings and making sure that the underrepresented um, populations that might not have transportation can get to them. Exactly. Um, oh. As far as the um, more coordinated approach, um, I think that's, that's kind of a double-edged sword um, because I, I agree that often when we, when we talk about issues like this, education and public health and parks does come up. Um, my, my concern is that the um, issues that we're really trying to get to the heart of as far as how um, we up here um, operate might get um, muddied in those other issues. Um, not saying that they're not important, because they are, and we do need to keep in mind um, what the other um, taxing bodies are doing. And so I'm not saying, you know, that's a bad idea. I'm just, I kind of some time to think on that mm -hmm. would, would be good because I do think there's a lot of pros and cons to, to doing something like that. Okay. 
to your point about um, finding uh, meeting locations where people feel comfortable, uh, we're going to be working very closely with city staff as well as with all of you to find those those precise locations. So thank you. Very good point. Thank and you. I was going to offer um, Kristen that um, accessibility yes. of the facilities is an issue that we've discussed and we've looked carefully at. And I'm not sure the Women's Center with that steep stairway entrance. Conexion also has a stairway entrance. Right, and I know there's a lot, you know, a lot of considerations to be made. Okay. Um, and I know, yeah, I, I'm not saying it has to be one of those two places. No. I'm just, you know, trying to think of your, you're talking about reaching out to the underrepresented um, populations. And I'm, I'm kind of in my mind comparing this to the recent meeting that the city had with, um, University Village and how incredibly successful it was having it at Westminster which mm -hmm. is right next to them where they could actually come to it um, and so that that's kind of the, the lines that I was thinking of and just kind of throwing names off the top of my head so. thank you it occurs to me maybe back transportation you know if we're moving from a neighborhood to a more central conducive meeting site <coughs> back transportation might be an option we'd consider excellent suggestion we're going to look at that because we want to make sure that as diana said all segments of the community are represented and if we need to provide transportation especially with people with disabilities or mobility restrictions we would definitely coordinate that thank you alderman Naylor. yes thank you i just had a couple of questions for clarification i'm a little uh, uncertain here but you're saying the uh, survey that was done advancing DeKalb County is not uh, a valid survey. So is the entire thing being sort of put aside, thrown out, and you're sort of starting over from scratch again? Or uh, wasn't that just sort of going to be a, a guide for this strategic planning of some of the elements that were brought out in that? That was the original intention. And we had about 2,600 <coughs> respondents, about 3% of the total county, um, but because the results were skewed toward a different profile, um, the DeKalb County Community Foundation is continuing its planning process using the issues um, that were the basis of the survey, and that's something that we can do with, with DeKalb as, as well. We've got some ideas about, in terms of order of magnitude, what, what people are saying, but we wouldn't want to rely solely on those findings. So how are we going to start then, or, I guess? And then secondly, uh, are these... Uh, reaching out uh, 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 inquiries, I guess, in addition to the original seven? The easy question, second, yes, we are. Um, so the seven town hall meetings plus a variety of smaller conversations around the city, again, going out to where um, the underrepresented groups are to see if we can engage them in, in understanding what their ideas are. So collectively there will be ten? Of like the smaller that. ones? Well, three of the smaller ones and then still of the seven. I suspect there'll be more than three of the smaller ones. Uh, we have to figure out exactly who we want to reach and okay. where geographically within the city we should go. There could be as many as a dozen, I think, if we really want to take this seriously and do it well. Okay. Back to your first point, your first question about um, how we'd start based on yeah. the, the Advancing to Calp County survey. What the, the current process, and again, this is kind of a work in progress, but the idea is to... Um, to use these meetings to pose kind of big idea questions. For example, um, what are you most proud of about DeKalb? Um, what changes would you most want to see in the city by 2025 to make it the ideal place to live and work? So, and a few more questions like that. But the idea is to have people kind of dream big and, and think about where the future might take the city. We'll use those issues categories that came out of that Advancing DeKalb survey as prompts. We can ask you know, questions about housing and about um, uh, public safety and um, food and hunger. Um, so it's a way to use those as probes to make sure that all those various areas are covered. That's our current thinking, at least. All right. If you have ideas, we're I welcome. Yeah. I would acknowledge that we are an active participant in supporting advancing DeKalb County. Um, in conversation with City Manager Gora this afternoon, I expressed my concern is that I don't want to let Advancing DeKalb County dictate our cycle in the community because I understood Advancing DeKalb County, the Community Foundation, is, in, is interested in tying into and um, 
uh, collaborating with municipalities doing their own internal planning. So I would encourage us to, to certainly be cognizant of tying in cooperating with advancing DeKalb County, but I don't want that necessarily to dictate our, our local cycle and calendar. Absolutely. Thank you. Other discussion? Hearing none, I would, um, what do we need, an amendment to the motion or, well, we've, we're authorizing, the motion is authorizing an amendment to the agreement. Yes. Do we have enough clarification from council? Yes, but I think we're looking for a formal approval of the resolution, which is amending the agreement. Okay. And this would be a voice vote in that there's no change in dollars? Okay, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, carried. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Ordinance 2015-8, adding section 516 to the municipal code relating to fire inspections of commercial buildings. And this is uh, ordinance 2015-8 is before us in first reading. Is there, um, Emery, would you want to introduce what action is presented to us? Yes, thank you. Uh, I do want to make a couple introductory comments and then if Chief Hicks has anything else to add, uh, you could step to the podium, but I do want to also ask City Attorney Dean Frieders if there's anything from a legal perspective because I know staff really did focus on uh, incorporating the comments and listening to the business stakeholders, whether it was focused to Cal or particular uh, suggestions on uh, the, the language. But I just want to clear up a couple things. Early on in the process, um, we did have focus to Cal when they came out with their original ordinance and had requested to meet with staff. And I did say Thanks. it was premature because we were still working through the concept. And this is where I guess we can agree to disagree that their focus was more on the wording at that point and our focus was more on the structure of the program. Um, we had a meeting last week and I guess I view meetings differently whenever I see Will Heinish at, I view him as a spokesperson for Focus to Cal, but there was more than one meeting. There were different meetings and part of the challenge is there's bl blurred lines between multiple organizations, whether it's DARA, DeKalb Builders, Focus to Calb. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, so last week we had a meeting and it became a apparent that we we're very, very close uh, in concept uh, uh, on the ordinance between what the city is hoping to accomplish uh, and what we're hearing from uh, the business stakeholders. So that last week it was suggested let's sit down and meet today. With my schedule I was unavailable but uh, you heard the three people that on behalf of the city that were available. I went back and I just kind of scanned my calendar and I don't have all the dates but I want to stress uh, especially for the community and those who are watching tonight the amount of time listening to all the stakeholder groups and not just focus to Cal. We had six different business stakeholder groups and as we started going through the process we had additional ones uh, come up. It was suggested at one of our meetings uh, by one of our local realtors to pull the realtors into the group. So we did meet with the realtors. After sitting down, um, I would add as an example, the chamber, we met with two specific groups of the chamber, one committee and one of the downtown uh, business uh, group. We heard that this was a concern and so one of the things I've started doing since November is we have monthly meetings now with all six business stakeholder groups. So we've been successful in having three of those so far, November, December and January. My plan is to continue those. We've been keeping this item um, as a standard, whether it's on the agenda, we'll address it. So all six of those groups, including Focus to Calb, were present at those meetings. We also had the major November 21st meeting uh, which we highlighted to the council where uh, all the stakeholder groups, not just their representatives, but anybody that wanted to attend that meeting. And I took a, a rough head count. I want to think it was in the vicinity of 50 or so people that were here at that meeting. We have had multiple public hearings um, uh, twice this month. So I, I just want to lead that. When I looked at my calendar date specific where we've met with Focus to Calb. I believe November 18th, December 8th, January 20th, January 26th, and I think there's a couple other dates in there. So I just want to clarify that. Uh, we've taken this very seriously that um, we're, we're here to listen. We're here to try to make this the best product uh, and the best program uh, available. So, um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to 
Attorney Frieders to address if there's any other particular issues, because I know in um, one of the ones in particular, Linda Waltz, um, letter we've tried uh, to specifically address the whole grandfathering issue uh, but with that I'm going to turn it over to Attorney Frieders. I would uh, echo the sentiments of some of the persons who spoke this evening in saying that we have had a number of productive meetings and the ordinance is improving as a result of that. Um, some of the <coughs> fine tuning that we're getting down to now is distinctions between should the ordinance indicate that the city shall complete an inspection or should the, should the city should the ordinance say that uh, the city shall conduct an inspection and is there a categorical difference between complete and conduct when you're using them to describe doing an inspection um, we are bringing forward an ordinance to you that we have uh, used our very best efforts to uh, comply with the applicable legal standards and the extensive feedback we've received from the community i want to clarify a couple points that have come up this evening <coughs> One is uh, with, respect to, with respect to the inspection form itself. Uh, the inspection form that's contemplated is the form that has been previously circulated. Um, it would be in a computerized format, but it is that form. Uh, it would certainly be attached to the ordinance when it is passed. Uh, it, uh, the ordinance indicates that it is not required to be codified. The reason that we included that language was simply to reflect that while it is a part of the ordinance, it's not required to be uh, published in the city's code book and add several pages to the code book. If you look at the ordinance based on the feedback received from the community, the ordinance indicates that the inspection form itself is approved by city council and that changes to that inspection form are required to be approved by city council. Um, while we would ordinarily think that the contents of the inspection form uh, might be something that uh, staff would have the ability to change from time to time, it was something that met with great public resistance. Accordingly, it is proposed to be uh, the province of the City Council to approve that and to approve any prospective changes that would be made to it. So if there is any confusion regarding that language, I hope that clears it up. Uh, it is not something that would in any way be secret or would be something that staff would have the ability to unilaterally change. With respect to grandfathering, I would <coughs> echo uh, Mrs. Walt's comments that that is one of the most challenging uh, considerations that the city will have prospectively and we have tried to draft language which if you review is as gracious as we could uh, derive um, the ordinance recognizes that uh, it's the intention of the city to recognize any applicable grandfathering provisions relating to buildings it is expressly recognized that not all buildings will comply with the most updated provisions of city building codes and that under uh, that under applicable laws existing buildings benefit from provisions in the codes that permit grandfathering of existing conditions. I, I would echo uh, Mrs. Walt's comments that going into a building, it may not be possible to immediately know what codes apply. That if a building has been modified over a period of time, um, that different sections may have different standards. And so what we've put in the ordinance is a requirement that if we go into a building and there is an issue or there's a conflict, that the city can't proceed to immediately saying this is what the standard is and you have to live with it. It says the city shall act in good faith and shall extend an opportunity to conference with the owner regarding the identification of the appropriate standard. The ordinance goes on to even indicate what kind of things we should take into consideration in trying to identify that standard, being uh, trying to identify standards that are appropriate for the building given its age, attainable given the nature of the structure, and appropriate to preserve public safety and the safety of the building occupants. We've also gone on to indicate that uh, if, if a conflict exists which is incapable of being resolved through that conference, that a building owner would have the ability to use the existing provisions of city code and go to the Building Code Board of Appeals. I would suggest that making that language shall mandatory uh, is not in the interest of the city or building owners because in some circumstances a building owner may believe that their best remedy is to pursue an alternate means of determining what the applicable building code is. Um, but again, as, as we looked at the grandfathering issue, I, I greatly appreciate the language that was submitted to the city. We looked at that extensively. We tried to draft language that even went above and beyond that by uh, making it clear that the city is compelled to meet with the property owner to work in good faith to try and identify standards that aren't just applicable, but that are actually practically attainable given the, the nature of the building and its age. Um, we uh, outlined all the changes that have been made to the ordinance to date. Uh, we are 
continuing to review and will continue to make recommendations to the city council as we move forward. Um, uh, then I think that's all that I have to add at this point in time. The only other thing I would add is we would seek any specific comments uh, from the council members tonight. If there's anything you want changed that uh, from the ordinance that is before you or the highlights that either Ch Chief Hicks or Attorney Frieders made. Um, and it is up to you on the timeline. When we have had multiple discussions on this, the, the timeline I uh, have communicated uh, based on uh, the direction from uh, from the city council was to do two public hearings in January, January 12th, January 26th. First reading the ordinance, January 26th. Second reading the ordinance, February 9th. You are in the driver's seat if you want to change that timeline, but we're really looking to see direction from you tonight. Are you satisfied with where we're going outside of uh, additional minor changes? Um, staff will meet with Focus DeKalb. We, uh, I sat down with staff for a few minutes after the meeting in between other meetings that I had. We're gonna schedule that as soon as possible this week. Staff will then make any additional revisions. We will get that out to the city council. We will get that out to the business stakeholders group. We'll post it on the website. Um, our goal, if you wanna keep with the February 9th timeline, is to bring that back for second reading. If you don't want that timeline, let us know tonight. But we, uh, we are, keep using the word, focusing our time on uh, uh, addressing this ordinance. So any feedback you can give us is greatly appreciated this evening. Okay, thank you. Alderwoman Lamb. Thank you. Um, just the, the comments from the public hearing, and you addressed one of them, which was the, the grandfathering issue. Um, the, uh, forgive me, I don't remember names, the gentleman from Elgin um, brought up the, um, a couple of issues, um, um, the issues of multiple um, unit buildings. So if there is a, a problem in one unit, um, will it then trigger a reinspection of the entire building or just that unit? Uh, that was Mr. Heisey, I believe. Uh, as the ordinance is currently drafted, it would be based on a building by building basis. If the council was interested in having that be on a unit by unit basis, we certainly could make that change. That would be relatively straightforward. I would suggest that if that change is made, um, it be on the basis of fully divisible units, units that aren't interconnected. Um, I, if you recall from the chief's presentation uh, now a couple months ago, uh, when the fire department completed their addressing project or as they're in the process of completing that, we've identified many spaces that are informally divided among different tenants within one common area that is not divided by locking doors and you know the ordinary indicia of what separate areas might be. Um, as it's currently drafted though, it, it contemplates going on a building by building basis but also contemplates coordinating with the building owner to make sure that the inspection is scheduled at a time that's convenient for them and, and convenient for the occupants ultimately. Mm -hmm. So we tried to strike a balance between those two issues. Um, Mr. Heisey also talked about uh, tenant responsibility and, and issues relating between the tenant and owner. Um, if you recall going back to the original draft of the ordinance, uh, <coughs> the registration process had contemplated that the tenants would be identified and the city would receive contact information for them so we could facilitate communications with the tenant and work with the tenant if there were tenant specific issues. That proposal to even identify the tenants received very strong pushback uh, from a number of members of the community. Uh, it is uh, very difficult to conceive of a way to interact with tenants without uh, necessarily being able to identify who they are or who the, who the tenant is or the company or the corporate entity that the company is. Uh, the, a significant number, if not the vast majority, of commercial leases in the city aren't recorded. There exists no formal public record that's accessible of who the tenant is. Um, as the ordinance is drafted, it contemplates interacting with the owner, the owner being the, the party that, uh, as was indicated tonight, is identifiable through public records, and the owner being the party that, at the end of the day, when a tenant has come or gone, is going to be responsible for the condition of the building. So that represents our staff recommendation regarding the orientation of the city's interaction. Thank you, and um, I, I definitely agree with the, with the um, <coughs> you know, they, if we're gonna go unit by unit, it should be independent um, units. But, um, you know, I just think that might save um, our, our staff some time if 
they don't have to, you know, let's say there's a three unit building or even a five unit building that if there's a violation in one unit that they don't have to then inspect five units every year. Instead, it's just the one every year um, and the others are on that ro rotating basis. So kind of trying to strike that balance between um, because I, I, I do agree with with what you said about the tenants, but that might kind of help to strike a balance between what um, the the between the tenant and, and the owner. I, I, I would uh, suggest that we can come up with draft language that accomplishes that very simply, and it would probably reflect something along the lines of um, separate and truly divisible units not triggering reinspection unless an issue exists which extends across multiple units. Mm -hmm. If it's an issue with a common fire sprinkler system that's out of service or a common addressable fire alarm system, um, that would be something that, that may require more detail. But uh, I would also note that right. under, yeah. under the ordinance as it's been revised, uh, if a unit does have an issue and if that issue is corrected, then the building would be on the three-year inspection cycle. So it would not be reinspected after one year. Right. Um, and then he did raise um, one other issue um, that I, I, I have seen raised from others as well, which is the um, key, the 24 hour um, key holder, um, where it says um, legal representative or something along those lines. And um, they bring up very valid points that that's not always, you know, or even usually maybe an, an actual legal representative. It might be a maintenance person or a tenant or someone along those lines. Is there some sort of change that, that'll be brought forward with that? That is certainly something we can evaluate. Um, that was one of the issues that Focus had raised in our meeting with them this afternoon. Uh, there are certain uh, emergent type needs that the key holder needs to have the authority to be able to take care of. Um, there are certainly also at the other end of the spectrum longer term needs of uh, having an owner representative that's able to uh, take you know, formal action on behalf of the mm -hmm. owner with respect to longer term issues. Uh, we can look at dividing those out more clearly, um, but I, I think the understanding the, the nature of the uh, emergency contact issue, that's certainly something we can explore. Yeah, maybe, maybe something along the lines of the, the key holder must have the authority to, um, instead of just saying legal representative. Does that make sense? And you yes. delineating the things that we need the key holder to be able to do. Yes. Thank you. Alder from Snow. Um, I'm just curious. I mean, I, I know there'll be changes from, from the first reading to passing this ordinance. I, I guess I don't know the extent of the changes that might be proposed over the next week. I mean, I'd like to have a fairly clean document to approve in first reading, but, you know, um, so I, I don't know if you can have any ideas to, I assume there'll be some changes that you will be recommending based upon today's meeting and perhaps a future meeting? Um. Yeah, the extent of changes, um, you know, for example, I gave you the, the, do we use complete or conduct? That was a, the ordinance currently indicates that the city shall complete an inspection of properties. Uh, Focus has requested that that be revised to the city shall conduct an inspection of properties. I don't think as city staff we have an objection to either word in the context of the mm -hmm. ordinance. So there are changes of that nature that I, I honestly don't believe have any impact on the ordinance, but that may be sprinkled throughout it. As far as actual substantive changes, uh, I suspect it's going to be the issues that city council discusses tonight. Um, the, the idea of separate divisible units not triggering reinspection, that's certainly something that can be accomplished and relatively simply. Um, delineating responsibilities of the key holder. Uh, that's also something that after the focus meeting and, and after the discussion tonight, we would look at. Um, I don't envision, I, I, we certainly want to listen to and will follow whatever the direction of the city council is. As far as uh, staff originated revisions, I, I'm not certain that there would be other ones that we would be contemplating. Okay. Alderman Panukum. Attorney Frieders, uh, one of the the discussion points for Mr. Heising, I believe, had to do with uh, even he wasn't able to necessarily get into one tenant area. And so would it be appropriate in situations such as that, that uh, building owners be allowed to ID the tenants that would be a direct contact for that rather than the building owner? Uh, just food for thought here. <coughs> I'd like to get some feedback. 
it is very challenging for the city to become involved in the landlord tenant relationship, not understanding the actual scope of rights between them and not wanting to put the city in a position of advising the, uh, the property owner on the extent of their ability to access different parts of the building or the, their lack of ability to do so. Uh, I can tell you that as we've looked at ordinances from other communities across the state and around the country, that level of detail and addressing that issue is not something that uh, frequently appears if it appears at all. It, it's not something that uh, there would be a best practice or a, a set of commonly used language that we would recommend adopting for it. Um, as the ordinance is currently drafted, it would treat that issue just like we would treat it with respect to any other interaction that we would have with a property owner, which is to say that we would respect the legal re uh, responsibility and, and uh, ability of each party involved in the, in the interaction, uh, the, the authority of the tenant, the authority of the landlord. Uh, I would also note that as the ordinance is drafted, uh, there's not a fine associated with not completing an inspection. Uh, the, the ordinance is drafted to provide incentives to responsible owners to complete inspections. The ordinance is drafted to uh, protect public safety and to give the city the tools to address properties that aren't inspected. Um, but uh, short of that, there's not a, uh, this isn't something where if a, a uh, property owner rejects the ability of the city to conduct an inspection that the city would be pursuing a fine for that action or a penalty of that nature. Right, but then, it, it, so then I'm correct in my understanding, though, that the owner of the building will still be the primary individual or corporation responsible for the building. Yes. Okay. okay. Other discussion? Alderman O'Leary. Yes. Um, as I sat here and I listened to the public hearing, different ones coming up, um, what concerned me the most is when, I'm not sure what his name is, when he said that he had built a building here and um, him and the fire department didn't see eye to eye or what the codes were. So he still have the buildings here, but then he moved and built something somewhere else. That's a concern for me because now <clears throat> with, our, with, our, with this commercial ordinance here, uh, we're not trying to drive away any of our existing building businesses based on if they cannot um, pass an inspection or their license may be taken away from them if they can't get a hold to their tenant or whatever. I think that our inspection should be, if it is unit by unit, for me, I'm in a unit, a separate unit, as long as it's a separate unit, not a, a unit together, but as long as there are separate walls, door, different entries, I think it should be by the unit for those that have units. But those who don't have units, if it's the whole building, it's the whole building. But I'm, I'm really concerned with the idea of, wow, we are losing business based on um, we didn't hear get eye to eye or mm -hmm. it wasn't a clear understanding of what the ordinance was. For, for me personally, I would like to move, make a motion to move this first reading to uh, February 9th to give everyone the opportunity to hear clearly and, and be on the same page before we move forward. Second. I, okay. We don't have a motion on the floor, so the motion on the floor is to move to uh, first reading on February 9th, correct? Okay. Further discussion? Alderman Naylor. If, Mayor, if I could, uh, if I could address two of those points briefly before sure. we move on. Thank you. Um, the, uh, with respect to the ordinance indicating that licenses can be taken away, what the ordinance recognizes is that under existing city code, uh, certain actions <coughs> of an owner could jeopardize existing licenses. And the, the most clear-cut example of that is, for example, under your liquor code, it indicates that buildings have to be in compliance with city code. It indicates that the city has the ability to conduct inspections uh, to confirm compliance with city code. And those are provisions that have been in the liquor code for a very long time. Um, we felt that it was important to identify for building owners that if the city is coming to conduct an inspection, the city <coughs> has this ordinance, but some buildings are subject to other licenses. The city doesn't have a master business license. 
Uh, it's not in the, there's been no discussion of having one. It's not a process of shutting down businesses, but if a liquor licensee was in a building and they refused the city inspection under the existing liquor code, that may have a consequence for them. So this doesn't say in it that they sh their license shall be revoked or the city shall take any action. The only reference to that is it says uh, refusing to permit the city to conduct an inspection may be grounds for action to be taken on the license. That would be under the existing code. So that's nothing new here. With respect to the impact on economic development, I'm going to uh, toss the ball down to uh, your community development director, Ellen DeVita, with respect to a comment that she had made in our earlier meeting today regarding her experience in other communities wherein the inspections that is, are contemplated in here are the norm um, and what impact inspections like this have on economic development. Sure, thank, thanks, Dean. Um, it was brought up at our meeting this afternoon, and while I appreciated the comment made that the ordinance um, could have a great effect on business friendliness, every community I've worked in has had this type of inspection to no detriment, and, and that was my comment made. And I believe Mr. Heisey himself um, even mentioned that in Huntley, he has no issues with the the inspection process there, that they come to terms with uh, sorting out between what the tenant is responsible for, what the landlord is responsible for. So uh, that's what Dean's referring to, I believe. And Eric also has some comments. This is for Alderman Larry's uh, comment on the water issue down on Enterprise Drive. Uh, Ten years ago or more, when that uh, subdivision started, uh, there was not sufficient water supply to uh, supply uh, those large commercial warehouses. Currently today, that problem has been rectified, and uh, I believe uh, within the last year, year and a half, we have, have, we have uh, built a substantial sub uh, addition to one of the buildings out there. So uh, at the time, uh, there was not sufficient water supply out there. That was not, uh, uh, the water mains had not been linked out to Peace Road yet, so it was a dead end main down there. Thank you. Thank you. Other discussion, Alderman Naylor. Yes, if I may, thank you, Mayor. Mayor. <coughs> I haven't uh, commented too much on, on this uh, subject matter since the beginning back in uh, August, I believe there. But I have followed it uh, quite closely uh, throughout the, the course of uh, all the uh, meetings and the public discussion as well as some of the private discussion. But I'd like to also thank the, uh, an extended appreciation to the staff and all the people that have contributed to the, to the uh, development of this uh, ordinance. It's not quite uh, near what I had anticipated or understood it was going to be initially, but in general I do support the, uh, the initiative here to uh, hopefully bring our, our commercial and our industrial buildings uh, <coughs> up to more acceptable uh, standards and uh, particularly from the public safety aspect of it being able to provide uh, safe uh, and uh, secure buildings uh, uh, for everybody to uh, utilize. Uh, somewhat, I've been somewhat amazed uh, uh, of all the uh, feedback and particularly uh, all the pushback from uh, those affected uh, property owners and tenants uh, throughout the, the uh, community <coughs> here. Uh, and somewhat on the basis that it's my, my uh, understanding vision basically started out uh, uh, several months ago to basically extend on to the commercial and industrial community out there a similar inspection program that is already in place for several other types of uses throughout the city currently. Now it might be tweaked a little bit uh, up or down uh, one way or the other, but in essence uh, the city is already currently inspecting uh, uh, restaurants, gas stations, rooming houses, and, I don't, and liquor establishments I believe, and I don't know how many more there are, but those are the primary ones. As well as uh, you know, I envision it be uh, compatible, somewhat <laughs> similar, likewise, to our crime-free housing initiative that was started a couple years uh, or so ago. Basically, taking a look at uh, the facilities that we have and working with the uh, uh, owners, occupants, to hopefully bring that into compliance to make it a much more safer facility and a better uh, building. Uh, to operate from and maybe sell your wares or uh, produce your products that you have. And likewise, 
uh, it's uh, it was taken back since you know the, the surveys that the fire department did and previous staff have performed indicating somewhat the opposite of what we hear and that uh, we are supposedly so uh, 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 ordinance uh, oriented regulated yet when we go out to the other communities other uh, peers out there we find that we're sort of the unique one that we don't have those types of regulations but now we are wanting to uh, implement those uh, regulations and in the uh, if I recall the numbers in the uh, survey that the fire department did that out of the 51 or 52 respondents to our surveys as to uh, whether the, the community performs uh, this type of uh, inspection of commercial industrial building 49 out of the 51 or 52 had these regulations in uh, effect and that's pretty much throughout the state. Uh, I believe the responses was from a good cross-section from southern Illinois to northern Illinois to east and west, a good cross-section, large communities, smaller communities, mid-sized communities. The only two respondents uh, are the only two respondents that didn't basically have this type of regulation, if I recall, was basically Sycamore and DeKalb. So, you know, I, I think it's something that needs to be uh, looked at maybe from a little different perspective and, and uh, it's, it's along the line of what I look at it that I think it would be an enhancement to our community to ensure the public out there as well as any newcomers, uh, old comers, that our properties are uh, safe and are, are compliant uh, with the regulations that are currently in place today. Uh, I've been, as I said earlier, I've generally, I, I support the, this, this initiative, but I do have uh, a couple, three, four concerns. And if uh, we're looking for some, some uh, changes possible, I would like to ask my colleagues up here to consider these four uh, concerns that I have uh, here uh, that have been uh, somewhat passed over or already uh, acquiesced, I guess, uh, by staff to the uh, uh, people out there that they have been working with uh, in developing this ordinance. And those four items are basically uh, the uh, no fee structure. Uh, I find that uh, somewhat unusual and basically creating a double standard here in the city of DeKalb, uh, wherein currently in all of our other similar types of uh, uh, initiatives, inspections, uh, fire inspection, life safety, and all that, there's a fee associated with it. And if you recall, just at our last meeting here uh, two weeks ago, the, the, the people that were applying for the uh, uh, license uh, for the Hoka bar up here, in their backup, they had already provided a copy of an application for a life safety inspection and had paid their $100 fee. And the same way is true <coughs> with rooming houses, same thing is true with liquor establishments. Wherever there's an inspection of this type, there's a fee associated with it. Now, I'm not saying that necessarily that the, these fees in the commercial buildings should be $100. Maybe they should be more. Maybe should be a little less. But I don't see and I can't uh, understand why we are considering implementing this uh, without some fee associated with it. Further, when you go and look at the uh, other fees that the city charges, you go into the building department code enforcement or other licenses, about the least expensive type of a fee I see out there is $60, 60 to $75 or about everything. Same way with our, our rental property. You know, everybody out there that has a rental property nowadays is paying a minimum of probably $50 to $100 a year for that program <coughs> and for licensing or, or registration. It's not licensing, it's just registration. So I, I really uh, would like uh, my colleagues up here to think about that a little bit. We granted <coughs> it's supposedly at no additional cost because we're going to utilize on staff firemen, but there are costs associated with it and there will be costs associated with it. And I don't see any reason to waive uh, a fee uh, uh, on a commercial or industrial building, particularly when some buildings probably will take uh, maybe a good uh, time longer than the smaller buildings, and it maybe should be similar to what is already currently on the books, uh, where they split the, the cost, I believe, at 35,000 square foot. Anything under that is 100 bucks. Anything over that is $200, et cetera. Uh, so I, I think that needs to really be rethought uh, because uh, we, uh, 
are having difficult times with uh, revenue and expenditures. And basically, in this day and age, there is nothing that is free anymore. Uh, you know, I pay uh, all the fees to, uh, when you come in to do something, and just like everybody else there uh, out in the community, business world, whatever it is, you come into City Hall, and there's a fee quite, uh, quite often associated with whatever it is uh, out there. And I don't see $100 breaking anybody or breaking anybody's bank out there. A second item is the incentives uh, uh, that staff has included in the uh, proposed ordinance. And I see this as somewhat like a, a, a double standard. I'm, I'm for compliance. I'm for working with the people. But to flat out provide some initial incentives right out of the box, uh, I don't think is inappropriate. In other words, it's sort of a, 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 a disincentive, I guess, for anybody to do anything out there. Well, I'll just wait until the city comes along and makes me do something, and then I'll be eligible for some incentives to help me uh, comply or whatever that might be. So I think that's uh, not necessarily in the right direction and not uh, uh, worded properly. I, I can understand for voluntary and if it's going to provide some definite uh, uh, benefit to the community, uh, maybe add jobs or, 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 or refresh the, the building itself, but to incentivize uh, some uh, uh, repairs that are needed because of uh, somewhat of a negligence upon the owner or the tenant of the property to repair their downspouts or whatever it might be that's non-compliance out there to provide some additional fire uh, items. Uh, I, I don't uh, concur with that. I own a commercial building myself. Uh, I've spent a lot of money on that uh, over the past several years, all out of our own pockets. Uh, there's been no, no city incentives there uh, on it. And I, I, I just think that uh, a lot of these costs and, and expenses should uh, be borne by the owners and not by the city out there. A uh, third item that I have an uh, issue with is the exemption uh, uh, out of the box here of all the home base uh, businesses. We don't even know what we have in the way of home base businesses out there. We don't know what kind of conditions they are or what they provide, what they do, what the issues are. But I do know from time to time we've had some discussions of uh, some conflicts out in the neighborhoods and the residential areas dealing with uh, home base businesses, whether it is a home base business or an auto repair shop in the garage or whatever it is. But I don't think we should unilaterally just automatically uh, exclude the home-based businesses. I think they should be included in the first round here at least to get registered and to be able to identify who, who the businesses are, where they are, and what the issues are out there. Fourth is the, somewhat the, the extent of the inspection, the basic fire inspection, which uh, I believe is across the top of the form. And th this is a, a start, in my opinion, but I think that some verbiage needs to be added to the section uh, there that also brings in some of the similar language that we already have on the books for uh, property, residential property inspection out there that basically uh, brings in some of the property maintenance uh, items as well. Because if you look at the current proposed uh, inspection form, it's primarily all fire related and maybe a little bit of electrical uh, related. And I'd like to see some language brought in there similar to what is used in the uh, chapter 13, uh, which is the uh, housing and property maintenance regulations and some language along the line of uh, for the purpose of discovering and uh, correcting dangerous or unsafe conditions and other property code or property material issues. Uh, that sort of covers it all, I believe, and it's been in place currently in our ordinance book for some time out there. Uh, I, I guess I would uh, likewise probably support uh, moving the first reading of this uh, until the next meeting um, and uh, bring back uh, for uh, the first reading then and maybe the second reading <coughs> the, the following meeting. Uh, thanks. Alderman Naylor, is your concern with the exemption of home-based ba businesses, does that equally apply to those home-based businesses that are subject to other judicatory inspections such as home daycare 
is subject to state inspection now, is my understanding. Well, yes, uh, right. Uh, and if that's the case, that's that's fine. But do they really inspect everything that the, the that you would want to inspect? As okay. an example, uh, what brought some of this to my attention was recently I saw an ad in the paper about in the daycare section on licensed daycare. Okay. So I, I, in, I mean, you can go around the neighborhoods and see some of these. Well, I mean, some offices have some fairly decent-sized parking lots alongside of them. They have a fair amount of foot traffic in and out uh, on it. But again, it gets back to my point to where we're just unilaterally up front excluding them unless we're thinking about okay. coming back at a later time and taking on that subject matter uh, uh, similarly. But I, at this time, I would see no reason why it shouldn't be included in kept in in the uh, purview of this uh, proposed regulation. At okay. least go through the process, uh, register all of them, find out who they are, what they are, and if there are any issues, if there isn't, then uh, in, in the future you could uh, exclude them. But I wouldn't exclude them up front. Okay. Other Thank discussion you. from council? Um, we do have citizen registered. William Heinish. Uh, just a couple brief comments um, in that the uh, I appreciate the consideration to postpone this till we finally cross the T's and dot the I's. Um, it was occurred to me in listening to, it seems like every hearing we get a little bit more piece of the puzzle, it keeps coming together. One of the things seems to be the registration needs to be real flexible in that a lot of options, some Business owners want the city seems to engage with the tenants and I've heard other business owners or property owners that don't So maybe it's possible that the registration form um, in Discussion that you have a lot of options so that if a Owner wants to list the tenants and wants the city to deal with each one of the tenants There should be no penalty or why not if an owner wants to provide all that information freely let him um, and update and verify that information on the flip side there might be owners that specifically do want to be Contacted before they go under their tenants. I think that's part of the rights So I think maybe uh, another piece of the puzzle some flexibility here in breaking down that registration and the people we identify in as options um, the uh, A little bit confused on city attorney Frieders um, the city can deny a license if you don't let them inspect part of your business, it says they will ref can refuse. Um, I just don't think that's good business or business language. Um, it, it goes back to the lever. Um, <coughs> I think that it is frustrating, but we are making progress. I think if you spent all the time that city staff has spent and we have spent, you know, we're probably two hundred and fifty thousand dollars plus if you put value on anybody's time and money spent. But I do think we're making progress, um, and I do appreciate the, the opportunity where we can continue to talk to the city as well as I would invite other people that have specific concerns where you can get a back and forth dialogue is much, much more beneficial, just like Ron Naylor can communicate back and forth. So thank you. Thank you, Will. Okay, we have a motion before us to defer first reading action on Ordinance 2015 dash eight until the February 9th council meeting. Further discussion? I'll ask for a roll call. O'Leary? Yes. Jacobson? Yes. Manukin? Yes. Lash? Yes. Snow? Yes. Naylor? Yes. Ray? Yes. Seven I? Thank you. Moving to Ordinance 2015-9, directing acquisition of the Protrano property from the DeKalb County trustee. <coughs> um, so moved? It's been moved. Um, would the waiving of first reading and approving passage on second reading be appropriate at this point, Dean? If that, if council so chooses? Yes. Okay. Would that be in the intent? Yes. Your motion, right? Yes, so moved okay. first and second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, discussion. Emery, city manager. 
Thank you. I'm going to ask Principal Planner Derek Hyland, who's been coordinating this project, to give an overview to the council and the public as to what this letter means and what it means to the future of Pertanos. With that, I turn over to Principal Planner Hyland. Thank you, Manager Gora. Before you this evening, I think you have an ordinance uh, that describes an acquisition of the Pertano property that has existed on South 4th Street for decades. Um, the city's involvement in this particular piece of property uh, goes back more than 10 years to 2004, where the city of DeKalb received a brownfield assessment grant uh, and explored the contamination on this property. Um, although it took roughly 10 years to finish the assessment, um, the individual parcels in and of itself for the Bertano family has gone through, uh, I guess I would call it a cycle of ownership to where it was owned by the brothers, Guido and Chester, and then since one of their passing to their estate. Um, and the history, if you look on the, the county's tax records, uh, the property has gone to tax sale a couple of times for the delinquent taxes. And so individuals have bought those taxes and returned them uh, as an error in sale. So fast forward 10 years to uh, the current year and last year, we completed the Brownfield Assessment Grant, determining the overall cleanup of uh, the site with the amount of contamination being that it was a junkyard with auto fluff, petroleum, uh, the contaminants from batteries and, and radiator fluid uh, was found on site. Knowing that there's a, an assessment and a cleanup cost associated with that in working with the state Illinois Environmental Protection Agency and the federal government Environmental Protection Agency pursuing grant dollars um, would warrant a governing agency to acquire the property, pursue those grant dollars. As you can imagine, there, the state uh, was happy to at least get the <coughs> assessment taken care of and understand what the contaminants are, uh, but wants some agency to be the lead agency uh, to pursue grant dollars. There were back taxes uh, that escalated over $100,000. The property uh, in its entirety for both parcels, I believe, went to tax sale last year, where as no one purchased them this go around. And so the county's trustee has since acquired the property and has made that deed available for uh, acquisition by the city of DeKalb for uh, an amount not to exceed $1,500 to take care of their direct costs for the publishing, the notification, and their staff time. So before you this evening is an ordinance with the acquisition of both parcels uh, that would deed over those two parcels to the city of DeKalb with the ultimate and long-term goal to then pers pursue and seek grant dollars to clean up uh, the Bertano property. Okay. And Mayor, I just want to add to Principal Planner's presentation that the city has actively pursued discussions with the county on acquisition of this property based on what we found in the, the previous grant and knowing that a redevelopment of the site has to happen under uh, governmental jurisdiction or to access these grants and we view this as critical and vital uh, towards the continued redevelopment of fourth street so staff strongly supports this but we needed to get direction from the council in order to proceed forward to take that next step with the county in acquiring the property okay. discussion I I think it's indefinitely time, and I certainly will support the uh, mm -hmm. effort here in the motion. Okay. Other discussion? Uh, I'll ask for the roll call. Jacobson? Yes. Finucane? Yes. Lash? Yes. Snow? Yes. Naylor? Yes. O'Leary? Yes. Ray? Yes. Seven I? Thank you. Ordinance 2015-2, amending Chapter 51 Traffic, Section 51.17, Municipal Parking Lots and Parking Stalls, 7th Street Parking Lot Restrictions. And this ordinance is before us in second reading. Oh, City Manager, Gora. 
or attorney. I was going to say staff could answer any questions. I would turn it over either to Director Moore or Attorney Friediers. Okay. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve and seconded. Um, discussion? Any questions? Hearing none, I'll ask for a roll call. <coughs> Finucan? Yes. Flash? Yes. Snow? Yes. Naylor? Yes. O'Leary? Yes. Jacobson? Yes. Ray? Yes. Seven I? Thank you. Ordinance 2015-10, amending Chapter 51, Traffic Schedule C, Parking Prohibited, Echo Park Parking Restrictions. And this is before us in first reading. Evening Engineer Mayor Leskowski. Evening Mayor and City Council. Um, the Echo Park parking restrictions changes. Um, While well, the neighborhood is located um, at the intersection of North Annie Glidden Road and Hillcrest to the west of that, and it's addressing Aspen Court, Fotis, Eco Park, um, Regent, and Spiros Court and pa Pappas Drive. The history behind this is that the, uh, if you were to drive out there right now and take a look at the parking restrictions, you'd find that there's four different parking restrictions within this small neighborhood. And this may have been part of the impetus of why this parking regulation was brought before you guys in fall of 2013. So in fall of 2013, there was an ordinance that was passed that was no parking 2 a.m. to 6 a.m., a tow zone in this area. And as part of this ordinance, including this neighborhood, also the Edgewood, Kimberly, and Greenbrier area also had this ordinance passed. Well, it, it came to came to be that the uh, the ordinance did not necessarily align with the needs of the community and the students and the um, the uh, landlords and owners of the Echo Park neighborhood. And so we we refined them. The recommendation was brought before the neighborhood safety committee. Um, with additional information indicating that from that um, additional, that first ordinance that was passed in Edgebrook, Kimberly, and Greenbrier, that there was a positive correlation between the reduction of parking on the street and the amount of service calls that the police department was receiving. So basically that's saying less on street, on, on street parking overnight correlates to less phone calls that the police department's going to have to receive. So. In, a, in addition to the potential for this ordinance to reduce the workload of the police department, it's also going to provide a uniform um, parking regulation to this neighborhood. And what's before you is no parking on the north and <coughs> west sides, or the north and east sides of each of these streets. And so again, this, uh, this ordinance was is being brought before you on first reading, and there has been outreach performed both um, or there's landlords in the area of Mr. Jim Mason, Mr. Mike Pitsley, and um, Mrs. Michelle Davis um, consulted in, in this ordinance and supported as well as the Neighborhood Services Committee. Thank you. Discussion or questions? Alderman O'Leary. <coughs> I do. <coughs> on, um, I, I agree with the, the no parking on the east sides of the street. Um, no parking anytime tow zone on all the streets except Varsity because Varsity uh, apartments there, <clears throat> they are the older apartment buildings there and they don't have enough parking in the back of the building to accommodate all of their <coughs> tenants on Varsity. So um, all the other parking uh, buildings in the Elko Park area, they do have enough parking behind the building if the students will buy the parking ticket to park in the lot. So I feel that um, that's why for bar varsity, I would like that to change. Like right now on the, what's that, the north side of the street is no parking from <coughs> December 1st to April 1st, which is the sign up right now, which I think that should still stay that way. But I think after April, they should be allowed to park on the north side just for the, <coughs> because they don't have adequate parking for those buildings. I think it's the Varsity and Varsity Square buildings there. They don't have adequate parking. Are you suggesting then, is it just no, would you prefer um, no parking on both <laughs> sides of the street or just shifting that no parking from the north side to the south side? No, I think they should still keep the south side. I think on the north side, it says here, no parking any um, anytime tow zone on the north side of the street and it's a snow route. Okay. So I think it should stay how it is 
the snow route is from December 1st to April 1st, no parking. But then after April 1st, they should be allowed to park because they have, <clears throat> they don't have enough parking space. Okay. Space is there. Okay. That was the only thing, everything else I agree with for that. <clears throat> That's certain something that we can take into consideration and um, look at it again and bring it back at second reading with that change. Okay. John, could we, and I don't know if you have this uh, in your information tonight, but could we determine how many parking spa vehicle spaces we're talking about in that stretch of Varsity Boulevard, yeah, it'd be the a north side of Varsity? I can take a, a rough estimate. For okay. You. Yeah. Thank you. Other discussion? Alderman Naylor. I guess for clarification, currently there's no parking any time on the north side of Varsity between December 1 and April 1, as yes. I'm reading on the schedule, is that correct? Yes. This is the way it's signed right now. <coughs> so wh what had happened is the, the ordinance that passed in <coughs> 2013 changed to, um, the parking regulations to reflect no parking 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. So right now the ordinance reads that there's no parking overnight. However, the signs were never changed to reflect that in the field because we had received feedback that these um, these parking regulations weren't weren't uh, meeting the needs of the community. So there's kind of a twofold issue, I suppose. Um, the current issue as it's adopted right now is the no parking 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. with a tow zone. So the map that you have in front of you labeled current parking restrictions is actually how you see it in the field because the change was never made. So. But they, they are abiding by that and obeying? The way the signs are up right now is I, I'd have to defer to the police department <coughs> to see if how many citations that are being issued, but it's my presumption that they are. Because um, if I recall that no parking, uh, April, no, December 1 to April 1, that's been there for a long time. Yeah, yeah uh, and I believe that's the way it's signed. <coughs> maintenance and all that. So, I mean, I, if, if to me, if they can live with it for those five months, I don't quite understand why they wouldn't be able to live with it for all the rest of the months out there. Because I, you know, from experience, that's a very difficult, problematic uh, street out there. And if anyone can remember some large snow events in the past, that that street was totally inundated with uh, snow and cars to where public works went down on top of the snow drifts, poking for cars underneath the snow drifts in there. Uh, and caused uh, many, many hours of uh, exercise out there. But anyway, that parking has always been an issue. And the, um, the Varsity Boulevard is a snow route currently and will remain so. Chief Lowry. Well, Commander Petrogallo, do you have anything you want to say <coughs> in regard to this? As a side note, we are not enforcing the 2 to 6 a.m. currently in that neighborhood. Um, I'd like to just bring up a, a few facts. Uh, the, goal, the goal of this new parking restriction is improving safety in the neighborhood uh, and the quality of life. And what we have seen in the past is wherever uh, large gatherings occur, wherever we have um, large parking lot, lots, for example, 809 Edgebrook, where the parking restrictions were changed uh, approximately two years ago, uh, we had very large gatherings that uh, occupied the, the parking lots of the buildings where uh, we had police response for service, for uh, drinking, weapons offenses. Uh, it ran the gamut, uh, fights that resulted in serious injuries. Uh, so we found that when the restrictions came into effect, uh, it gave the police an extra tool uh, in addition to extra patrols that limited these large numbers of folks uh, occupying the parking lots. And a lot of these folks that are attending these gatherings are not residents of the buildings. Uh, so um, because we saw a, a benefit to these restrictions, we thought we would try to mirror them in the Echo Park neighborhood. Uh, we also looked at the data. The data showed in the uh, Edgebrook, Kimberly, and Greenbrier neighborhoods in 2012, our total calls for that area were 961 in 2013, uh, which is 
um, just prior to the restriction taking effect, 1,557 calls, and in 2014, after the restrictions were put into effect, 1,123. So that they went down about 400 calls. Uh, so we wanted to mirror that, um, and in doing that, we wanted to keep it consistent, which is why we had the entire neighborhood um, with the <coughs> north and east sides of the streets, no parking anytime tow zone, and uh, the south and the west unrestricted. Uh, with the exception of Varsity, which was uh, a snow route. Um, we did reach out to um, residents and property managers and owners, and we did get a lot of feedback, which caused us to uh, tweak our proposal. Uh, so what you have before you is what uh, we spoke with several of the residents and landlords in the area and came up with uh, all who are in favor of it. Um, so again, uh, we were faced with uh, trying to reduce uh, crime in certain areas and calls for service, and we felt that after looking at Greenbrier and uh, Edgebrook, especially Edgebrook, uh, we saw a significant decrease, not to say that that is the only reason it decreased, uh, but we feel that it was a strong, strong impact uh, once we begin uh, utilizing the restriction and tagging a car with a parking ticket or towing a vehicle. Uh, back a couple of years ago when things were bad in the Edgebrook neighborhood, we saw that these crowds were dispersing very quickly, and it was a very good tool for us. Um, I believe that's all I have. Do you have anything else? <coughs> I'd just like to add to that. In, in some ways, I agree with Alderman O'Leary. In some ways, I don't regard to her specific comments. It's my understanding, based on the housing study that was done several years ago, that the apartments, when they were constructed, were, built, were designed and built with adequate parking space available for the tenants. And I think what we've seen, especially through complaints from landlords and Crime Free Housing Bureau, is that many of the apartments are unlawfully sublet. And what ends up being multiple people living in what was designed for maybe two or three or four people, there ends up being several. So there are multiple cars that end up needing places to park, albeit from an unlawful perspective. I, I think what Commander Petrogallo said is exactly on target. It's important to mirror what we've already done and we've got a successful model with. Uh, the other thing is, if it's, it's imperative to also reduce the confusion in that neighborhood for for students and residents alike. Uh, I think the parking ordinances are very confusing over there. We literally ceased and desisted on parking enforcement in the neighborhood because it created so much confusion based on the variety of ordinances that were in place. So we're hopeful that the, these changes uh, will supersede anything that has been there in the past and also address not only public, public safety needs, and when we think about just calls for service, that's one thing. But there are a lot of students day and night, but where I think we get the most concern is at night, who traverse those streets and city, in the city, in those neighborhoods, on foot. And uh, the amount of motor vehicle traffic in that neighborhood during those busy times is very high. So we're, we're extremely fortunate we haven't experienced numerous pedestrian-related accidents or fatalities in that neighborhood. Getting cars parked on one side of the street is the optimum way. Thank you. Questions, further discussion? <coughs> Do we, we have a motion before us to approve the ordinance? <coughs> and it's been suggested that there be consideration for the adjustment of that no parking on north side of varsity between now and second reading. Did I understand that correctly? Yes. Okay. I'll ask for a roll call then on the motion. Lash? Yes. Snow? Yes. Naylor? Yes. O'Leary? Yes. Jacobson? Banukin? Yes. Ray? Yes. Six I? Thank you. Moving to Ordinance 2015-11, amending Chapter 51 <coughs> Traffic, Schedule C Parking Prohibited Hickory Street Parking Restrictions. 
and this is before us in first reading. Um, this this parking ordinance was um, brought to us by a petitioner, and it was brought before the Neighborhood Services Committee to take a look at the potential for creating a parking restriction on Hickory Street. Um, initially, the petitioner was hoping that we could um, make a restriction that would only apply to the property in front of, or the right street in front of her house. When the Neighborhood Services Committee took a closer look at it, um, they felt that a uh, uniform um, parking restriction on, on the west side would probably be a more optimal way to go just because it would allow better for clearing of snow. snow. Um, it would provide adequate width for the fire truck when it had its outriggers open. And it would have uh, enough room for um, cars to maneuver on it. Right now, it's a dead end street, and the width is uh, about 32 and a half feet. So, really, the most you want to have, um, I, I think, safely would be one side of the street for parking would be optimal. Um, <laughs> it has been suggested um, up to this point that um, it, more outreach could be performed on this uh, on this block, and all the uh, tenants and homeowners should be consulted. So um, with that, I'd like to be able to perform that outreach before I bring this back on a second reading. Okay. Alderman Naylor. I would just echo that uh, in talking with the uh, petitioner and the <coughs> John there, that that's what uh, was suggested to notify all the property owners and the occupants along that street and uh, give them the opportunity to comment uh, before a second reading is, is had. But, the uh, parking in that section of the street, likewise, has been problematic uh, for since the be uh, beginning of time almost. Uh, since it is a dead end street, there it's difficult to maintain, particularly in snow plowing and weather like this that we have out there on it. So, the uh, elimination of parking on the one side would certainly pro provide a, a benefit to the uh, uh, citizens, at least during the winter months and snow times. Thank you. Older woman laugh. Thank you. Um, do do the residents on that block have driveways? Yes. So if we're removing some parking, they still have places to park their cars? Yeah, I believe. Okay. Yeah. I, I think every single unit residence has a driveway now on that block. That, so, yeah. Thank you. Okay. I, is there a motion then to approve Ordinance 2015-11 with the understanding of further um, dialogue? So with Neighbors. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. <coughs> um, all those in, uh, roll call. Snow? Yes. Naylor? Yes. O'Leary? Yes. Panukin? Yes. Lash? Yes. Ray? Yes. Six I? I would just parenthetically note to council that we just approved on first reading ordinance 2015-11, which we've asked for further dialogue and potential revision to the ordinance before it comes before us in second reading. I realize this ordinance is much simpler than the building inspection ordinance, but earlier this evening, council was resistant to pass on first reading with the understanding of minor modifications coming back to us. So I just, I just note that, uh, that fact at this point. Um, moving on to Ordinance 2015-12, amending Chapter 64 smoking regulations regarding retail tobacco stores and school setback. And this is before us in first reading, uh, Attorney Frieders. At the January 12th meeting, there was extensive discussion and the City Council had taken some, I, I think it'd be fair to characterize it as provisional action to revise the setback requirements uh, for the licensed uh, tobacco establishments. The ordinance established them originally at 1,000 feet that was passed by the City Council this uh, the summer of 2014. At the uh, last meeting, the City Council revised that to indicate that it was 1,000 feet but could be waived on a case-by-case -case basis or could be shortened on a case-by-case -case basis based upon the unique circumstances of any given applicant. Uh, and the City Council subsequently approved a license for an establishment that had an approximate 300-foot setback. Uh, at that meeting and following that meeting, staff had contact from uh, council members that were on both sides of the successful uh, motion to make it the conditional setback. 
uh, and accordingly we've brought back additional options. Uh, option one would be to reduce the setback to 100 <coughs> feet, which would mirror the setback for retail liquor establishments. Option two would be to reduce the setback to 200 feet, which was a number that had been discussed by City Council at the last meeting. Option three would eliminate the setback entirely. Uh, and option four would be to make no changes, which would keep the current process with 1,000 feet and the potential for conditional waivers. Um, we bring this forward. It's purely a matter of policy consideration for the City Council. At the last meeting, we had some discussion of some of the underlying safety and public policy issues that attend to this issue. Uh, we are happy to answer any questions that the City Council may have. Okay. I would just note in our previous discussion on this ordinance, um, the issue was raised that we're not being business friendly in um, having that thousand foot setback and then dealing with it on a case by case basis. I would offer that it really is a values consideration by this council as to what you want those neighborhood constructs to be around our neighborhood schools. It occurred to me a 100 foot setback is really one lot width from that school, approximately, assuming 100 foot frontage lots. Um, 200 feet is two lots, 1,000 feet is 10 lots. Um, it really becomes a values <coughs> consideration in my mind as to what we want those neighborhood schools environments um, to consist of. Personally, I'm in favor of leaving the ordinance um, as written um, with a thousand foot setback and reviewing on a case by case basis. I'd entertain other discussion. Alderman <coughs> Um I'd like to think that, uh, you know, instead of handling on a case by case, the, the sites are going to be limited by uh, commercial <coughs> zoning anyway. And I think a, a 200 foot setback might work well uh, for the majority of cases. If we leave it at 1,000 feet, I remember our discussion from two weeks ago. Um, it was determined that there'd be only two sites in town that we wouldn't have to uh, make some variance for. I think that a 200 foot setback would eliminate the need in most cases for us to do anything in terms of a variance. And so I would move that uh, the ordinance proceed with uh, option two. Okay, it's been moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, further discussion? <coughs> Alderwoman Lash. Thank you. Um, I, too, am in favor of, of leaving it as a case-by-case -case basis, although I think I'd probably be willing to compromise on the 200. Um, and, and, you know, I was kind of um, examining my own, you know, thoughts on this and why um, this should be... Um, different than the bar setback. I've been asked that. And I think the biggest um, uh, difference between um, what we're discussing tonight and bars is the business hours. Um, whereas bars are usually open after school hours. Um, they get their most traffic after school hours. Um, some of these um, establishments would be having their uh, customers coming during school hours, and they would be open during school hours. And so that's that's where I um, that's where I draw the line um, for myself on that. Okay. Could you have All the um, snow. Uh, I'm not sure what the business hours really has to do with with the setback. Um, it's when anyway, the kids are uh, present. Well, kids are present during the day when alcohol can be sold during the day. I guess my first thought was to make it the same as the, the uh, liquor ordinance, but I'd, I'd be willing to go with the 200. I, I think a thousand foot setback is excessive and and, uh, and on business uh, friendly, and um, the 200 setback would be fine with me. Okay. Other discussion? I, Alderman I, I'll just comment. I, I too, I. I uh, ex expressed my uh, thoughts on this uh, at the last meeting, and I, I still remain with that. I, I still think they should be on a case by case basis, and I don't know where the number two that there's only two locations in town that you would have an opportunity to build and 
live by the thousand feet. I don't know where those are at, but I'm certain there's more than that out there than just two of them. And I, I, I think it would work best if you just maintain it at the thousand feet and uh, apply that uh, equally. And if there is good reason to adjust it at the time, depending upon the particular location, the surroundings, uh, the, the type of uh, entity that's going to be, and then make that decision at that time whether you want it to uh, vary, vary from the 1,000 foot setback. So I would support uh, leaving it as is. Okay. Other discussion? Okay. The motion before us then is to approve Ordinance 2015-12 with a 200 foot setback uh, with the option to review on a case by case. Uh, is that I, correct or not? As not it's review. drafted, it is just a 200 foot setback. 200 foot setback. Correct. Okay. Um, but they would always reserve the right uh, to come back before us and ask for a change anyway, correct? It, anyone could request a change in city ordinance from a, it, as, I, I guess that's technically the answer. I mean, from a processing licenses perspective, if we have someone that comes in and applies for a license and clearly doesn't comply with the standards. It would have to come back in front of council and be case by case anyway, if it was under the 200 that they were looking to do. Correct. I, I would no. say. I would suggest that if that's what the council wishes to have, <coughs> that that be what the ordinance reflect. Because if, if someone comes in and applies for a license and clearly doesn't comply, uh, I'm not certain that it would be brought forward to council in that fashion. Alderman Nalen. I, I would like to move to amend the ordinance uh, from 200 feet to 1,000 feet. Is there a second? I'm, can I second the motion? I didn't think so. Is there a second? Hearing none, that amendment will die for lack of a second. So the motion before us is option two with a reduced 200 foot setback. Yes. Further discussion <coughs> or question? I'll ask for a roll call then. Naylor? No. O'Leary? Yes. Jacobson? Yes. Finnegan? Yes. Lash? Yes. Snow? Yes. Ray? No. Five I? Thank you. Okay. Um, moving to communications. Um, I do have a letter from Sycamore Fire Department Fire Chief Pete Larick I'd like to share. And this is addressed to Fire Chief Eric Hicks. Dear Chief, on behalf of the Sycamore Fire Department, I would like to thank you for your organization's assistance at two structure fires during the week of January 5th, 2015. On Monday, January 5th at approximately 4.01 p.m., the Sycamore Fire Department was called to a single family structure at 1552 Plank Road, Sycamore, Illinois for a possible structure fire. This was a challenging fire due to the structural weakness on the first floor, which the initial crews found at the outset. As a result, responding fire companies were forced to operate entirely from the exterior. In addition, this was a rural fire operation which required us to provide a continuous water supply source. Your agency responded with an engine to the scene for over four hours. Then on Jan Friday, January 9th at approximately 3.33 p.m., the Sycamore Fire Department was called to a fast food restaurant at 439 East State Street, Sycamore, Illinois, for the, a possible structure fire. Initial companies encountered a fast-moving commercial structure fire, which quickly overcame the initial arriving companies. Your agency again responded with a truck in chief to the scene for almost three hours. In addition, you provided an engine to respond to later emergency responses in town while the structure fire was going on. Both of these incidents were challenging due to the cold temperatures, temperatures and snow. 
As you know, in both cases, we experienced some firefighting equipment and fire pump issues due to the low temperatures. In addition, the snow-covered e environment along with icy conditions due to fire attack hose line operations made for very dangerous fire ground operations. I am happy to say that we did not experience any personnel inju injuries on the scene of either incidents. The success of both of these responses were a result of a total team effort. It's reassuring to know that we can rely on our neighbors for assistance when we need to. Again, thank you for your support of the Sycamore community. <coughs> Sincerely, Pete Polaric, Fire Chief, Sycamore Fire Department. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Chief Polaric for that recognition and congratulate Chief Hicks and the department's response. Thank you, Mayor. Conversely, we've had Sycamore over here twice since then also, once tonight for some of our motor vehicle accidents and also once for our downtown fire. So they have reciprocated already. So thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, Alderman Jacobs. No report. Alderman Finuca. No report. Alderwoman Lash. No report. Alderman Snow. No report. Alderman Naylor. Uh, just the thanks to Public Works Police, uh, particularly the Crime Free Group that is handling some of the sidewalk issues, snow removal out there. Appreciate all the help. Okay. Alderman O'Leary. Yes. Um, I would like to say to the staff that I appreciate all the hard work you all do. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> City Manager, Gora. No report. City Attorney, Friedars. Uh, just briefly, uh, we had the commenter from Prairie State here this evening talking about 7-Elevens, and I wanted to update the City Council. Uh, the first 7-Eleven that we had involved in the, the uh, your legal efforts here uh, successfully obtained a full-time position with the Zeke Georgi Legal Clinic up in Rockford, and has been very successful in that endeavor. Uh, the second 7-Eleven to go through the process here just completed her services in December and is currently looking for full-time employment and I think has a very promising career ahead of her. And we have another 7-Eleven that will be starting next uh, next Monday. Uh, so as the cycle has worked, it has been typically third-year NIU law students have been interested in the process and it represents a fantastic way for them to build practical skills and to build their resume. And it's been a very, very successful uh, project thus far, and, and we thank you for the council's continued support of those kind of internship opportunities. Thank you. Um, not to put our new, newly appointed city clerk on the spot, but <laughs> Marsha just expressed my delight in having you approved and uh, sworn in to, at this point and officially seated. Any comment? <laughs> oh, interesting. interesting. <laughs> <laughs> And you don't have to, but <laughs> you will be offered the opportunity each meeting if you choose to comment. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll not keep you on the spot. Uh, assistant City Manager, Patty? No report. Chief no Lowry. Report. No report. Finance Director, no Chief report. Hicks. Uh, Community Development Director, Ellen. In Divina. our next meeting, Jamie Smurz is going to be bringing forth the preliminary information on the consolidated plan. It's a five-year plan through our community development block grant program. She's been holding a series of public meetings to ascertain needs and look for projects that meet HUD's goals to serve lower income uh, neighborhoods in the community. So I uh, just wanted to alert you to that coming. It's a five-year plan. Thank you. Public Works Director Moore. Uh, good evening, very briefly. I just wanted to uh, recommend that everybody drive very safely tonight, but I wanted to kind of bring that back to what we are seeing today. This is an entirely forecast, unforecasted um, drizzle that we're still receiving right now, and it's not even showing up on radar. And one of the unique hmm. aspects of DeKalb is that we have a lot of motorists that are relatively inexperienced driving around the community. In some cases, people that only have two or three years of wintertime driving under their belt and very, very challenging conditions. So as we bring parking and on-street parking and driving issues to you as a city council, they have very, very far-reaching implications. And so I'm just kind of drawing tonight's weather to some other topics, but it is something that we take very seriously and please drive safe. Thank you. Um, yeah. At this point, um, we don't need further executive session. Okay. Um, 
which would bring me to a motion to, to adjourn. So moved. Moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Both same sign. Carried. <laughs> 20 minute break after Cal and, and Hopefield.